strange lights, a sense of missing time, memories of unearthly beings. Claims of alien abduction are one of the more perplexing phenomena of the 20th century. Sometimes called close encounters of the fourth kind, these experiences are said to involve humans taken aboard UFOs by aliens. In the past 30 years, there have been thousands of reports which cry out for an explanation. A logger claims he was abducted in the woods by space aliens and dropped off on the side of the road five days later. A performer from New York City reports being carried onto a giant UFO while his fiance sat paralyzed in the car. Under hypnosis, a couple remember watching in horror as small gray beings snatch their baby from her crib. And two horse breeders tell fantastic stories of their meetings with aliens ever since they were little girls. There is no evidence to substantiate any of these claims, but thousands of ordinary Americans tell remarkably similar stories. Some people say these are hoaxes. Others believe they are earnest delusions. But for the rest, it's one of the great mysteries of our times and remains unexplained. One of the best known and most controversial cases took place near Snowflake, Arizona on November 5, 1975, at a time when there were few reported cases of alien abduction. The everyday life of logger Travis Walton would never be the same. This is his story. Well, this was a long, hard day. We had just finished work. I was tired, but uh, I was <laughs> looking forward to a long drive home. The crew had worked until after sunset, hoping to complete the logging contract for crew boss Mike Rogers before the first snowfall. Travis, Mike, and five other loggers squeezed into a pickup truck. They were driving back to town when they say something very strange happened. Just as soon as we got around the trees that were between us and it, we saw it hovering just less than 100 feet away and wow it was just it was just like you know we come around these trees and wham it's just the the sight of this thing was just so uh in, intense nobody else got out of the truck just him i wasn't about to get out At first i was you know kind of showing off for them thinking that this thing was just going to take off before i got up close to it but the closer i got the more i realized it wasn't going anywhere and i was starting to have second thoughts well, I yelled at him to get the hell back from there, you know? What are you doing, you know? It just looked, it looked dangerous. I'd already decided I needed to make a run for it. I raised up and turned to go, and something hit me. Something shot out of the bottom of this uh, thing, and it, and it hit him in the head and chest area. It was a beam that came down, but it created like a, an explosion of some kind, like an explosion of light. I didn't know what happened after that. I was just completely out. His companions panicked and fled, leaving Travis motionless on the ground. When they returned a few minutes later, the alien spacecraft had disappeared. They began to look for Travis. All these tough logger guys, you know, at least we think we are. And when we get out of the truck, we meet in a huddle right in the headlights of the truck. And we start walking around looking for Travis, all in this little tight huddle, just scared to death. I was nauseated, I was so scared. Travis was nowhere to be found. The next day, their story was all over the news. The townspeople mounted an extensive search of the grounds and combed through vast tracts of the forest for clues. When the search failed to uncover any trace of Travis, Sheriff Marlon Gillespie suspected foul play. I was probably leaning more towards uh, a crime of violence of some sort. I felt that Eventually, one of them would spill the beans and tell us what had happened. Local gossip pointed the finger at Mike Rogers and the crew members. To clear their names, they agreed to take polygraph tests. Five of the six men passed. The test on the sixth man proved inconclusive. Five days after his disappearance, Travis says that he awoke on the side of the road a few miles from where he vanished. He staggered to a phone booth and called home. 
And then when I found out how long I'd been gone, I was so blown away by that that I was kind of like uh, catatonic for a while. These illustrations by crew boss Mike Rogers depict Travis's account of the events of the missing five days. Travis remembers waking up in the spaceship on a table in a sterile room, feeling tremendous pain in his upper body. Suddenly, he says, he was looking squarely into the faces of horrible creatures. It was the most terrifying sight of my life. I, you know, they were sort of human-like in form, uh, two arms and two legs and uh, like that, the human arrangement of features, but they were definitely not human. The eyes, they just seemed uh, just to look right into me. There was a sort of an indifference there that I found very frightening. Travis says he sat up, screaming at them to get away from him. He grabbed a nearby object and swung at the creatures who backed out of the room. I was uh, screaming all sorts of threats at them, and I was prepared to, you know, fight my way past them to escape. Travis describes being taken to a domed room that looked like a planetarium. When he pushed the buttons on a chair that seemed to be in the middle of space, he could see the stars. A human-like creature appeared and led him to another room where he encountered similar beings. He says he was eventually led out into a giant hangar that contained smaller spacecraft. My God, he remembers thinking, the sweet Earth could be millions of miles away. In the more than 20 years since the alleged alien abduction, not one of the loggers has come forward with a different version of the story, despite pressure from the media and offers of payment for a confession. But the questions remain. I think that the individuals that were subjected to the polygraph examination seen something that they thought was a UFO. I believe also that Travis Walton uh, was not taken aboard a UFO, but I, I believe that he, he truly believes he was. I never set out to just to, to, to prove myself or to bring this to the world. It was, it was a uh, worldwide news story when I was returned, and so I really had no choice about it being known. I was just basically, and have been ever since, just reacting to other people's reactions, defending myself against all these accusations and, and trying to set the, uh, the record straight. A research scientist at MIT, David Pritchard, organized a scientific conference about abductions many years after the Walton case. He is not yet convinced that the case for abductions has been proved. It's possible that these were caused by real aliens, but the only way that I'm going to believe it, uh, and I don't mean just as a scientist, the only way I'm going to believe it in my heart of hearts uh, is if we can find physical evidence. Nobel Prize winning physicist Leon Letterman joins other skeptics in saying Travis concocted an elaborate hoax to make money and attract attention. To fake the story is the simplest thing in the world. I mean, we have to be skeptical about things. Why does a person do this? He does it to make money. Uh, if you look at the uh, things you have to accept in that story, they're so much more incredible than uh, just saying this guy is out to make a buck. Here I'm, I'm struggling to deal with the emotional impact of what I've been through and then to come face to face with a, a sort of a obstinate and irrational skepticism. People, people wanting to uh, attack me uh, without even knowing the facts. Though Travis Walton's story was portrayed in a movie based on his book, Travis claims he has profited little from his experiences. The net effect financially has been negative. The net effect on my life uh, has been negative. I do not in, enjoy the attention or the notoriety. I, I just wish it had never happened. Travis remains convinced that his experience was real. Though there is no empirical evidence that it did happen, Travis replies there is no proof that it didn't. For New York entertainers Elliot and Deborah Novak, rehearsals are routine. Yet nothing could have prepared them for that long night 13 years ago when they say they were abducted by a UFO. 
They are just now coming to terms with the full range of their experiences. I remember thinking to myself, God, if they want to take us, let's go with them. I have a fond memory of it is because it felt like a letdown when it was over. Not like I was relieved when it was over. I felt like I wanted it to go on longer and here I was back, you know, in New York. Television producer, writer, and entertainer Elliot Novak and his then fiance performer Deborah Studer finished their show at Grossinger's Resort Hotel in the Catskill Mountains at 11 o'clock on August 23rd, 1984. Within minutes, they had packed their bags and props and were on their way back to New York City via Route 17 South, a trip that would ordinarily take them about two hours. Tonight, however, things didn't work as usual. Elliot looked up and saw a set of mysterious blinking lights. He pointed them out to Deborah, and she pulled over. The lights stopped blinking and began to move toward them. Only then, did they see three separate lights located on the corners of a giant triangle, a dark metallic object. This illustration is Elliot's interpretation of what they saw. It was so large that you couldn't see any sky if you looked left or right or back. It filled your entire line of vision and peripheral vision. It was like the size of a football field, was the best way I could describe it. The object moved over the car without making a sound and suddenly stopped, bathing them with an intense bluish-white light. I remember at one point um, seeing a flash of light and then nothing. I do remember the feeling of butterflies in my stomach and uh, as if you were in a small plane that was going up and down and changing altitude. The next thing they remember, the object was gone. The passenger door was open and Elliot's legs were hanging out. But there was something even more puzzling. I raised myself up and closed my pants up. I had no idea what was going on, why my pants were down, what I was doing with my legs out of the car, why Debbie didn't say to me, what are you doing with your legs out of the car with your pants down? Nothing. We said nothing to each other. We just drove on. They arrived back in New York City about an hour and a half later than usual. In the morning, Elliot woke up feeling a strange soreness in his groin. The aftermath the next morning of being sore down there and having bruising on my, on my thighs and on my legs and, and on my groin and, uh, and uh, I uh, urinated blood uh, that morning for the only time in my life, the only time this ever happened to me. Oddly enough, an article in the New York Times the next day provided details of similar UFO sightings reported over a period of months by thousands of residents in the Hudson Valley. Accounts of a gigantic triangle with lights in the summer skies. Science educator and author Philip Imbrogno says he was one of those who saw the three-cornered spacecraft. He has gathered more than 7,000 reports of related sightings in the area. Among these were more than 175 reports of abductions. The number of cases that offer good data we're talking about people who are looking for publicity, people who have passed psychological testing and so on. The number in the Hudson Valley is still staggering, uh, well over 175. I uh, didn't know anything about abduction. I didn't know anything about spaceships. So um, it wasn't until after it was over did I really begin to think that I was taken aboard an alien spacecraft. In 1984, the Novaks were certain of the UFO sighting near Grossinger's in the Catskills. But it wasn't until February 1997, 13 years later, that they would consider the possibility they might have been among those abducted in the Hudson Valley. It all started when a friend gave Deborah a copy of Missing Time, written by UFO researcher Bud Hopkins. I opened it up and I couldn't put it down. I stayed up all night and read it. And I saw many similarities to to things that had happened in my life. Not only the Grossinger experience, but other experiences in my life as well. Hopkins, who has investigated more than 600 abduction reports since 1975, agreed to help them, suggesting hypnosis as a way of recovering experiences they may have repressed. When you work with somebody who's having these experiences or has had them over, over a number of years, uh, you're aware that there's a core series of experiences, many of which they might not be consciously aware of. Bud Hopkins, while not a therapist, 
consults with psychologists and psychiatrists, and has lectured to hundreds of mental health professionals who want to find out how to look into abduction experiences. Hopkins served a seven-year apprenticeship as a hypnotist before working on his own with people who believe they might have been abducted. In February of 1997, Elliot Novak underwent hypnosis in Bud Hopkins' office. The videotape from that session shows Elliot as he remembers finding himself in a cold room on a metal table with shadowy figures nearby. Is there any part of your body where you feel that tingling more intensely than any other part, or is it all over? It's just in my groin, like I mm -hmm. fell asleep. I could see my legs up because I could see the tops of my knees, but I had no feeling there whatsoever. Um, but the fellow on the right was doing something down there because I could see him. I could see his head right here. I just can't imagine that they would and perform these. I mean, how often will you, do you have to do that? During her own hypnosis, Deborah reported that when the UFO passed over the car, she turned to Elliot, but he was gone. She had apparently been left behind. After their hypnosis sessions, Deborah and Elliot compared their newfound recollections. You didn't see me next to you. Where was? Where did you? Did you see me anywhere? No. Outside? No. My next recollection was is that I um, I pulled back onto the uh -huh. road, and uh, he was there again. Deborah not only recalled the 1984 UFO sighting. She also remembered a night in 1982 when she recalled lying in bed terrified while a strange light filled the room. This time it was she and not Elliot who was taken. She recounted chilling details of what she says occurred aboard the alien craft. It's your abdomen, do you feel something different yes. there? What do you feel at the abdomen? It's different. <laughs> Describe it to me. Happened a long time ago, it's gonna be okay. Gotta... Put my hand back in your forehead. My hand's coming back, calming down, feeling, feeling better. They've got what? Just tell me very clearly. You have a needle. A needle. needle. Uh huh. Where's, where's the needle? Uh, Feel my hand in your forehead. Soothing. Calming. It's in me. It's in. Oh God. Critics say that the alien abduction experience is invented when a person is under hypnosis, and that hypnotists plant the abduction stories when a person is in a vulnerable state of mind. Even members of the UFO research community acknowledge that such manipulation is possible. Psychologist Stuart Appel says that hypnosis can also create false memories. These false memories can be believed with complete conviction on the part of the individual who was hypnotized. To that extent, mm -hmm. hypnosis must be used with great caution and with great skill so that one avoids creating false memories, especially memories of the kind that can have a major impact on one's sense of identity, one's sense of purpose, uh, one's worldview. David Jacobs, an abduction researcher, agrees. He has conducted hundreds of hours of hypnotic regressions and thinks that abduction investigators should develop standard scientific procedures. Anybody can do hypnosis on anybody else uh, if, as long as that person wants to be hypnotized. Uh, the problem is, is that people can fabulate. They say things that are not true. Their memory is faulty, even under the best of circumstances. Bud Hopkins argues that the memories of abductees are deliberately wiped out or suppressed by the aliens during an abduction experience, and that hypnosis has been extremely effective when conducted carefully. This isn't some, something like a self-repression of memory that might go on with somebody who said something terribly traumatic and doesn't remember it, uh, which we do know happens. Uh, this is a thing which seems to have been imposed from the outside. Hopkins says he uses hypnosis to counteract a similar state induced by the aliens. He recovers memories he believes the aliens have suppressed. Journalist C.D.B. Bryan, who has written a book about abductions, does not believe that abductions are real. But he has watched Hopkins hypnotize two other abductees and defends him. I've watched him try to lead them, to demonstrate to me, for example, that you 
cannot make them say something that they don't want to say. And I think the great criticism against hypnosis is that they are trying to please the hypnotizer or they're simply making things up. I didn't see this happen. As UFO skeptics and researchers debate possible explanations for the abduction phenomena, Elliot offers his own. Eventually, everyone is going to be made aware of this. Uh, it's happening with too much regularity. It's, uh, it's, it, it's happening to, uh, to people who, who never believed that anything like that could happen to them. Um, it's, it's beyond the, the, the realm of the lunatic fringe uh, uh, reporting these things only. And, um, you know, you can't, you can't prove it to people who don't believe. You just have to wait, and it, uh, that's human nature. You know, until it jumps up and bites you on the nose, it's, uh, you're not going to believe it. We're just ordinary, everyday people that this has happened to. And it can happen to anybody. I didn't want to believe that it happened to me, but it did. Joyce Ahrens and her family believe that what happened to them was not an isolated incident. One highly controversial study conducted by the Roper Poll suggests that hundreds of thousands, even millions of Americans, have memories that indicate that they may have been kidnapped by aliens. Abduction researchers believe these abductions happen generation after generation, as this family from West Plains, Missouri can attest. Their story starts one evening in the fall of 1976, in the presumed safety of their home. I remember just lying there, trying to relax. I'd opened my eyes, I seen a red light flowing across the ceiling, which it almost looked like uh, the Aurora Borealis. Dan and Joyce Aaron say the room was dark except for the unusual light, which they describe as about four or five feet in diameter. They say it hovered over the baby's crib at the foot of their bed where their one-year-old daughter, Heather, slept. Dan says that when he tried to get up, he found himself immobilized. That was the most frightening feeling I guess I've ever had in my whole life is not being able to move. I was screaming for him to help me because I couldn't move. And I didn't know that he was paralyzed too. And we both sat up in the bed at the same time I said, what the hell was that? The incident was over in what seemed like an instant. The baby was standing up in her crib looking dazed but unharmed. Dan and Joyce thought they had just shared a scary dream. That is until 1992, 16 years later. Dan, a computer technician, was working at his keyboard when suddenly he was seized by panic. I immediately thought I was having a heart attack because uh, I started sweating real bad. Uh, my ears were ringing. It was a real tight feeling in my head. Dan was rushed to the emergency room where doctors ran tests and ordered x-rays. When the results were in, they concluded that Dan had suffered an anxiety attack and sent him home. But the symptoms persisted. To see him like that was devastating. Um, he couldn't leave the house. He was so scared. After six weeks of constant fear, Dan sat down in front of the TV trying to relax. He turned on a movie that happened to be about alien abductions. Dan experienced a sudden revelation. There was one part in that movie that uh, this little creature, whatever, was kind of peeking out from around the door. And it was in the dark and the shadows, you know, and everything. And I immediately just, my heart started racing, and I just kind of completely went out of it again. Dan wondered, was his anxiety somehow related to the subject of the movie? He later chanced upon another television show about alien abductions and watched an interview with therapist John Carpenter, the national director of abduction research for the Mutual UFO Network. Dan immediately contacted Carpenter for help. He suffered from a panic disorder at that point in time and he had flashbacks and nightmarish images of these beings but didn't understand what was going on and needed some relief. Dan agreed to an on-camera hypnosis session with Carpenter, during which he revisited that memorable night in 1976, the night he saw the red light over the baby's crib. This time, under hypnosis, he remembers more. 
He recalls cowering in the corner of his bed as he watched alien beings take his daughter Heather from her crib. He went to the crib. He went to the crib. Picked her up. Uh huh. I can't move. You can't move. You don't have any control over what's happening to you. What do you see happening now? I took her. Under separate hypnosis, Dan's wife, Joyce, recalled the same sequence of events. They both say little beings marched them outside. Together, the family was floated onto a spaceship. I never wanted it to happen to my children. I didn't realize until later that it had. But when they took her, I couldn't do anything. Heather now 22 and married, remembers a series of abductions beginning in childhood, when she was forced to play telepathic games with the aliens. How do you play the game? If I pick up that one, he'll let me go. Hmm. What are you feeling? I want to go home. Mm-hmm. What does he tell you about that? If I pick it up, he'll let me go. The Aaron's family believes alien kidnappers have not only intruded in the lives of their children, but are now visiting one of their grandchildren. He calls them his little buddies that come in his room and play. He said he wanted to watch the ship leave. I'm not going to tell him that it's not real because it is real. Skeptics would say that Dan, Joyce, and Heather could have constructed their stories together before hypnosis. But then they'd have to know how to answer the trick questions and the leading suggestions which I provide. Plus, there are many details they wouldn't know about that we would be looking for as markers for truthfulness and reliability with other abduction data. Researchers also believe abductees are sincere because of another consistently reported feature of abduction accounts, the insertion of alien implants. I uh, turned my head to the right, and this taller being came over. And he kept telling me that it would be OK, that they wouldn't hurt me. And then they took this. Uh, very long needle and they put it up my right nostril and I closed my eyes when I heard it crunch and then I became very calm. Objects said to be these implants have been recovered. MIT's David Pritchard has examined the composition of one of these reported implants in a laboratory and contends there is absolutely no physical proof of alien activity. If we don't find physical evidence, and we haven't, then we have to lump this in the category of fairies, elves, near-death experiences people report, or we're going to be back to the days of the medicine men running our society. With the help of hypnosis, Dan's anxiety subsided and he returned to work. But what once seemed out of this world has now become a part of his life. If this is some sort of mental thing that's happening to people, then why aren't they out, why aren't the scientists or the doctors or whatever trying to find a cure? Two Virginia women report extraordinary stories of being abducted together by aliens for more than 40 years. Anna Jamerson, and Beth Collings, not their real names, claim these so-called paired abductions are ongoing to this day. Beth is a professional horse trainer, lecturer, and farm manager. 
She works for Anna, who owns a horse farm, and is also a consultant for the U.S. Forest Service. I'm not entirely sure how many experiences Anna and I shared. Uh, we can account for somewhere close to 30 or 40 uh, from early childhood. On a December evening back in 1991, Beth was headed for Anna's farm where she lived while teaching horseback riding. Having driven this stretch uneventfully many times before, nothing hinted that this trip might be different, but it was. I saw lights in the sky. I thought it was a, a plane that was in trouble, yet the lights were not coming toward me or moving away. They seemed to be stationary. Curious, Beth parked and got out. Above her, the lights shone with an unearthly intensity. She hoped to catch a glimpse of a fuselage of a plane or a helicopter. And then it struck her. There was no sound, as you'd expect, just silence. And the lights were frightening. And I, I couldn't understand why that was familiar to me. And I wanted to run as fast as I could, and yet I couldn't move. I had to see. It, within a blink of an eye, the, it, I was surrounded by light that seemed to be coming from these lights in the sky, uh, very close overhead at that point. And uh, again, within the blink of an eye, I was not there. Instead, Beth was back on the road more than an hour later. Beth says she assumed she was having a nervous breakdown. In desperation, she sought out the help of her close friend and employer, Anna Jamerson. My first reaction was that she'd been working too hard, so I needed to stay home from work and give her some time off, and she would get herself back together and things would go on as, as normal. But things didn't go on as normal. Beth had another disturbing experience on a drive home from a business engagement. Again, there were lights and a period of time she couldn't account for. After the second time, I knew there was something definitely wrong, that it wasn't that she was losing her mind, that something else was going on, because she had seen bright lights in the sky both times. At that time, Anna knew little about UFOs. She and Beth had once seen some unusual lights over the barn, but she didn't think much about it. Now, she became concerned. I knew I couldn't handle it. We couldn't handle it together. And I knew somehow to look up in the phone book, UFO, and I did. This was this, this stable, down-to-earth woman who found a phone number listed under UFOs of all places. Anna eventually spoke with one of the organization's leaders, Richard Hall. After meeting with them, he agreed to study Beth's case. They're quite intelligent. They're quite articulate. They're not New Age ding -a These are human beings, intelligent people in important professions, very responsible people. I thought it would be they'd come out and interview her and tell us that, gee, yeah, we've heard of this happening. It happens, you know, once, maybe twice if you're really lucky. And then you have great stories to tell your friends, and it never happens again. Unfortunately, uh, they didn't tell us that. Instead, Hall was noncommittal. He gave the women no encouragement in either direction, despite his own views. This is something, I have a long background in uh, straightforward UFO sighting investigations and have become convinced uh, some time ago that it appears that we have visitors from somewhere. And it's just one step from that on to, well, maybe they really are tinkering with us. Hall suggested Beth undergo hypnosis. The regressions triggered a flood of conscious memories for her. Frightening images emerged from other abductions as well. But I was lying on a table on my back, and my head was placed in a, a kind of restraint, and I saw this instrument coming down toward my face. I was terrified, first of all. Secondly, when I realized what they were going to do with this pronged instrument, I couldn't believe it. Beth claimed she could feel the pressure of her eyeball being pulled free of the socket, and that it was extremely painful. Unconcerned, the aliens went about their business. Something was done behind the eyeball, some procedure behind the eyeball that I could feel but I couldn't see, obviously. <laughs> the eyeball was then in some way reinserted or replaced in the socket. Beth's accounts were disturbing, yet equally striking were Anna's strong emotional reactions to them. Hall suggested that she too undergo hypnosis. I screamed because right in front of my eyes, the first thing I saw when I was hypnotized, and she took me back to the time when the headache started, I had huge black eyes right here in front of me. 
unsettling flashbacks, dreams, and partial memories. Many concerning, disturbing medical procedures are typical of those who believe they've been abducted. They seem to continue to put probes and either inject stuff or take stuff out of the back of my head from my brain. Um, they ram stuff up my nose, they have burst my eardrum, I've had holes in my head, behind my ear. Um, I have had stuff injected into my veins and my arms. Skeptics of alien abductions often point to the seemingly crude nature of the medical procedures described by Anna and other purported alien abductees. Is this further evidence of the human imagination at work? In every case, what the pre people report are, are a distillation of their own experiences. You know, the flash of light, the blinding light, the, 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 the beam that pulls you up and so on. These are your own experiences. This may not be the way uh, a real advanced civilization would do it. And skeptics ask, why would the aliens invest time and attention in duplicating such trivial experiments? If there's a super intelligence out there they don't have to abduct people. They can know everything there is to know from one drop of blood by one person. But I will say that in the case of Beth and Anna and many other abductees that we've studied around this area, we have seen physical evidence. We have seen the markings on the body that are so common. Critics say that the markings Hall refers to may well be ordinary scars and not compelling evidence of alien contact. In fact, as Hall admits, there is no physical evidence that would stand the test of scientific scrutiny. Even abductees have their doubts. I'm always questioning the validity of my experiences. I'm always questioning what I remember because memory is in itself fallible. I don't think it's likely that we're going to find proof, absolute proof in a strict scientific sense uh, that people seem to demand anytime soon. But even without evidence, Beth and Anna claim to have been snatched a combined total of over a hundred times. They believe that often they were abducted together. The same things will happen to us the same nights. Um, when we're abducted, we'll go through the same program together. But there are still times when she'll be abducted and I won't, or I'll be abducted and she won't. Or we'll, once we're abducted together, we'll be separated somewhere during the experience and then come back alone. Together or alone. Beth and Anna say one thing seems certain, the abductions will go on. People who claim to have been abducted by aliens remember many similar medical procedures. According to Beth Collings and Anna Jamerson, some of the experiments include alien-induced pregnancies. The procedure for pregnancy was insemination, a form of insemination. Um, there was no there was no sexual contact, certainly, but it, 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 the, the action was very much like insemination. Beth says the results of the alien insemination were not long in coming. I would have an abduction. A month or more later, I would start having morning sickness. Later, Beth says she would be abducted again and something removed. Then, according to Beth, the symptoms would cease. They take it as if you were nothing more than an incubator. It's like being raped over and over and over again. No anomalous pregnancy has ever been medically documented in an abductee. Nevertheless, Anna and Beth even describe being presented with hybrid human-alien offspring. When this child is supposedly born, it's presented and I have been told, this is your child. It looks like a cross between human and them. I don't feel like it's mine. I don't, I don't relate to it. I remember them presenting me with children. They tell me are mine, and they want me to hold them, and I won't, and I've dropped them. Both skeptics and believers wonder why extraterrestrials would so aggressively manipulate the lives of Beth and Anna. Anna says she has seen visions of the destruction of the Earth by earthquakes, windstorms, and fires. She says the aliens have her in intense training to learn to fly alien spacecraft and assumes this training will enable her to leave the planet if these terrible times come to pass. This is where I at least feel I get to um, pilot the ship, steer the ship. 
I've been told I'm being prepared to live some other place, whether that be another planet or a spaceship or all I know is it's someplace else. Beth still prays for an end to the ongoing abductions. When I'm terribly, terribly frightened and it's a typical human response is, oh God, get me out of here. If you save me from this, I'll do anything you want. Whatever the true nature of the abduction experience, it appears that Anna and Beth are among the many people in the country and all over the world who are engaged in an earnest attempt to understand a mystery that has taken over their lives. I get angry at them, but yet I want to know more about them. I want to know why they're doing this. I want to know why they're doing it to me and my family, why they're doing it to a lot of people out there. I think there's much more to be learned from them to be, than to be afraid of them. I mean, what is the point? What, are we going to run off and hide in a cave somewhere and hope that they don't come and take us? And even those with no direct tie to abductions can be caught in the mystery. They find themselves tempted by intimations of a new reality. Oh, you get immersed in a, in a topic like this, and after two years inside this thing, uh, I was vulnerable too. You know, there was hardly an evening where I didn't step outside and look up at the sky and hope that the light passing overhead was not an airplane or the moon. Many abduction researchers have convinced themselves that these experiences have to be real. They have no doubts. People are physically missing from their normal environment. Police have been called, search parties have been sent out, distraught mothers have been in hysterics, where's my children? All of this is part of the abduction phenomenon. And not only that, people come back with unusual marks on their bodies and scars on their bodies that weren't there literally the day before or an hour before. Scientists who have closely studied the abduction phenomenon are not convinced. They question much of the evidence. Some experiencers report strange scars. But many people report strange scars, that is, scars that they do not remember the origin of. Others might report implants, but when such implants have been extracted, they so far have not indicated anything unusual. So in the face of this consistent lack of evidence, the people who are claiming, oh, aliens are real and we have plenty of physical evidence, just are not facing the facts and I think are being uh, very irresponsible. Despite arguments about the nature of the evidence, the abduction phenomenon defies explanation by both believers and skeptics. For instance, psychological and medical tests have shown that people who say they are abductees are not more fantasy prone or suggestible than the general public. They do not suffer more from sleep disorders or multiple personality disorders. So in the end, we are forced to return to where we started, with the abductees themselves. We have a phenomenon of thousands and thousands of people from around the world coming forward and saying that they have been abducted. All of them fully aware that saying something like this is completely crazy. I don't think there is any human being who's been through abduction experiences who has not been severely traumatized. My opinion about the abductees was, if I can use a medical expression, that they were crazy as loons. You know? Now, I feel a lot more compassionate towards them and respectful of what they're going through. I don't think they're crazy as loons. At the same time, I can't honestly say I believe they are being abducted by aliens. Nor does physicist Leon Letterman. For him, the claims of alien abductions are a testament to the urgent need for scientific literacy in our culture. It makes me redouble my efforts to improve science education in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, all the way through secondary school. I think that's crucial and hopefully trying to raise a level of scientific understanding of the general public. I know what I've seen, and there's nobody in this world that's going to tell me that I didn't see it. I've seen them. I've touched them. I've been there.
Here are people who believe they've been taken to a reality that is not ours. They have traveled to a world that they cannot understand, a world that remains unexplained.